Chapter 18 is called The Spy Guy. Cherry Hill Park is the closest and the coolest campground to Washington, D.C. It has two swimming pools, a hot tub, sauna, game room, miniature golf, and a playground. But after they checked in, none of the McDonald's wanted to hang around Cherry Hill Park. Everyone, and especially Pep, wanted to go into the city and spend the afternoon at the Spy Museum. The Washington subway system is called the Metro, and the Green Belt stop at the end of the Green Line is right next to Cherry Hill Park. Dr. McDonald had been to Washington many times to do research, so he knew his way around. The family took the Metro 10 stops and got out when the train reached Gallery Place, Chinatown. This is the heart of Washington, Dr. McDonald said as they emerged from the station. They walked a short way down 7th Street and made a right on F Street. The White House is about seven blocks that way. The Capitol is about seven blocks the other way, and Ford Cedar is right around the corner from here. That's where Abraham Lincoln was shot, you know. We know, said Coke, who knew just about everything and didn't particularly enjoy hearing things he already knew. The Spy Museum is directly across the street from the Smithsonian American Art Museum. After they paid their admission, the McDonald's were taken by elevator, along with a bunch of other people, to a little room. There, they were instructed to choose a cover identity from a bunch of choices displayed on the walls. Just like real spies, the McDonald's had to memorize important details of their fake lives, like their names, where they were born, and they did for what they did for a living, and where they were going. After that, visitors were free to roam around the exhibit. If you ever go to Washington, you have to go to the Spy Museum. It's the only public museum in the United States that is solely dedicated to espionage, and it covers the history of spying from biblical, to, biblical times to present day. There are exhibits devoted to concealment devices, sabotage weapons, intelligence gathering, audio surveillance, threat analysis, maintaining one's cover, and dead drops. A dead drop is a place, like a hole in a tree, where a spy will leave something for another spy to pick up. That's as opposed to a live drop in which two spies will pass something like a briefcase from one to the other pers in person. In the display cases, they have lots of cool stuff like lipstick, pistols, micro dots, and cameras hidden in everything from pens to buttonholes. One room is devoted to hero pigeons, where, which were once used to carry secret messages. Before the days of st uh, satellite surveillance, pig pigeons even wore tiny cameras to take photos from the sky. There is also a section devoted to famous spies who led dub uh, double lives. Some of them were caught and sometimes executed. Did you know that Julia Child, the French chief on TV, was a spy, Pep asked her brother? Sure I did, Coke replied. In fact, he had no idea that Julia Child was a spy. He didn't even know who Julia Child was, but he didn't like the idea of his sister or anybody knowing something he didn't. Pep, of course, knew a lot of, of this already because espionage was one of her obsessions. The other was the Donner Party, which you would know if you read the Genius Files, Mission Unstoppable. But she enjoyed seeing all this stuff with her own eyes. It was like the museum had been built just for her. Coke and Pep were fascinated by spy paraphernalia, while their parents were more interested in cyber spying. How countries are using the internet to spy on one another and disrupt communication systems. The kids and grown-ups agreed to split up and meet in front of the museum when everybody was finished. Hey, check this out, Coke told his sister after her parent, his parents left. A dog do transmitter. In fact, it was for real. Inside a glass display case was a long lump of what looked to be either a sneak, Snickers bar or a dog poop. The plaque on the wall said that hidden inside... Uh, it was an actual radio transmitter that the CIA used in 1970. Towards the end of the exhibits, off in a dark corner and leaning against a fake brick wall, was a statue of a man. He was tall, dressed up in a trench coat, d dark glasses, black gloves, and a hat. He was carrying a briefcase. The statue looked just like a typical spy from an old movie. The twins walked up to it. It looks so lifelike, Pep said, but it's just a dummy. Suddenly, the statue moved its hands and put it over Pep's mouth. She tried to scream, but the sound was muffled. Who you calling dummy? The statue asked. For a moment, Coke almost lost control of, the, of his bladder. What the? He said instead. Shh, the guy in the trench coat said, removing his hand from Pep's mouth. You'll blow my cover. Are you a spy? Pep asked, trembling. Do I look like a spy? The guy asked. Yes. That I'm not a spy, because if I was a spy and I looked like a spy, then I wouldn't be a very good spy, now would I? No, I guess not, Pep said. A good spy wouldn't look at all like a spy. Right, 
and because I look just like a spy, I couldn't possibly be one, could I? No. Uh, but of course, if people are convinced that I'm not a spy, that would be the perfect cover for a real spy, wouldn't it? Coke looked at the guy closely. You might be a bad spy, he said. I might be, or I might be a guy pretending to be a bad spy. I'm confused, said Pep. See the glasses I'm wearing, the guy said. There are uh, cynic uh, cyanide pills concealed in the earpieces. If I had to, I could chew on an earpiece for a minute, a few minutes, and kill myself. Glasses like these were actually used in the CIA in the 1970s. I bet you're just an actor who gets paid to hang around the spy museum answering questions about spies, said Coke. Maybe, or maybe I'm a real spy pretending to be an actor who gets paid to hang around the spy museum answering questions about spies. Huh? said Pep. Maybe I'm a spy, and maybe I'm just a guy. I'll call you Spy Guy, said Coke. Agreed. Whatever you are, said Pep. Can I ask you a question? Shoot. I mean, go ahead. We received this message the other day, Pep said, pulling the white piece of paper out of her pocket, but we don't know what it means. Spy Guy examined the white paper, then held it up to the light. He put his briefcase on top of a trash can and popped open the locks. If there's any message on this, he said, it was written in with invisible ink. See, I told you, Pep said to her brother. There are two ways of writing invisible messages, Spy Guy said. Wet systems and transfer systems. A wet system uses ink that is only visible when it's exposed to heat or chemicals. A transfer system would use something like carbon paper. He took the gizmo about the size of his cell phone out of his briefcase, flipped a switch, and the gizmo produced a bright purple light. The message is probably written in special fluorescent ink, said uh, Spy Guy said. Ink emits visible light only when exposed to ultraviolet light or specific wavelength. You really are a spy, aren't you? Pep asked. Maybe, maybe not. Spy Guy shined the ultraviolet light over the piece of white paper. First from left to right, and then from right to left. He looked at it carefully. So what does it say? Coke asked impatiently. Nothing, Spy Guy said, turning off the light. Uh, what we have here is a plain old white piece of paper. Oh, no, Pep said. Maybe your brother was right. Maybe white paper simply meant White House. But what did the white paper have to do with John Bull or Dumbo the Flying Elephant? There is one other possibility, Spy Guy said, as he took a cigarette lighter out of his pocket. What's that? Pep asked. The message could have been written in with milk. Milk? Sure, Spy Guy said. You can make invisible ink out of milk, lemon juice, saliva, vinegar, and even soapy water. Anything that will oxidize when you heat it. He flicked the lighter on and held the flame a few inches below the paper. Are you going to burn it, Pep asked? No, the Spy Guy said. The chemical compounds in milk have a low burning point. As the paper heats up, the chemicals turn, turn brown, but the rest of the paper stays white. Look, Coke said, it's, it's happening. Slowly, the lines on the paper began to darken. A few broken letters appear, and then gradually, so did the rest of the letters. In less than 30 seconds, it was possible to read the whole message. Dorothy's Ruby Slippers. That's from Wizard of Oz, Pep said excitedly. Dorothy wore a pair of ruby red slippers, and the um, at the end, she clicked them together to go home. Coke and Pep reviewed all the messages they had received. July 3rd, 2 p.m. Greensboro Lunch Counter. John Bull, Star Spangled Banner, Dumbo the Flying Elephant, Dorothy's Ruby Slippers. The question remained, what did all these things have in common? What tied them together? Well, I hope that was helpful to you, Spy Guy said as he put his stuff away and closed the briefcase. Yes, thank you, Pep said. So you are you a real spy or not? asked Coke. If I tell you I'm a spy, I could be a spy, or I could be lying, and I'm not really a spy, Spy Guy said. And if I tell you I'm not a spy, that could be the truth, or I could be lying, and I'm really a spy. So it doesn't really matter how I answer that question. But I will say this. Don't believe what anybody tells you. Don't believe what any you tell yourself. Don't believe everything you see, hear, smell, or taste. Don't believe every anything. That's my philosophy. Great, Coke said. Listen, we have to go. Do you really have to go, Spy Guy said, or are you just saying you have to go because you don't want to talk to me anymore? Yes and no. Good answer. When they finished at the Spy Museum, the McDonald's took the Metro back to the campground. Dinner was burger and hot dogs on the grill, followed by toasted marshmallows. Afterward, Dr. and Mrs. McDonald went to see what movie was playing in the outdoor theater. Coke put on his bathing suit and went for a swim. Pep walked over to the little camp store to get a pack of gum. After she paid the cashier, she went to look at the rack of brochures by the door. It was the usual tourist stuff. Local maps, travel guides, as for Washington, bike tours, and interesting attractions like the Spy Museum. Pep, 
was about to leave when her eye was caught by a flyer on the bottom of the rack. Peb looked at the flyer, her eyes opened wide. After scanning the first two lines, she gasped and almost fell over. Discover highlights of the National Museum of American History. Short on time, this guide will help you find some of the things you will want to see. Star Spangled Banner. Greensboro Lunch Counter. John Bull Locomotive. You okay, Miss the Cashier S? Yeah, I gotta go. Pep grabbed one of the flyers, dashed out of the store, and went running frantically in the direction of the swimming pools to find her brother. After two laps around both of the pools, she finally found him sitting in the hot tub, his eyes closed. Coke! Coke! She shouted out of breath. What's the matter? I know what all that stuff has in common. What stuff? Coke asked. What are you talking about? The stuff in the ciphers, Pep said. The Greensboro lunch counter. John Bull, the Star Spangled Banner. And all that other stuff? I know what it means. Okay, Coke said calmly. What do they have in common? They're all right here in Washington at the National Museum of American History. You gotta be kidding me, Coke said, getting up out of the hot tub. How do you know that? Pep handed him the flyer. And tomorrow is July 3rd, Coke said solemnly. We've got to get to the museum at 2 o'clock.